time for us to uh, start May 10th Cal. So uh, welcome all and Sue. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to take this opportunity because I missed it in the past to introduce our new staff. Um, Kathy Lewin is with us. She is the general manager of municipal services. This is all of council. <laughs> Councillor Hillgartner. Yeah. We're mostly friendly. So. Yep. Karen, is Alan, is Alan online? Okay, when Alan comes, maybe council will introduce you to him. Perfect. Okay. Help? Any additions nope. to the agenda? So is there any new additions to our agenda? None? No, sir. So we'll go to uh, new and unfinished business. Uh, City-owned policy. Committee report. Sorry, forgot that. Committee reports. There we go. Touching the wrong button. Any committee reports? Just start off. Kevin or Don? Kevin? Um, well, I'd like to say we've had quite a few good meetings with the um, Inclusiveness and Diversity Committee. Uh, I think this is a committee that we can really do good work with. And we're, we're still just finding our way, but I've had a lot of conversations with, with people that are involved. And um, other than that, I haven't had a lot of meetings with other committees. I'm technologically inept and I tried to get into the hub meeting Thursday night and I must have hit the wrong button on the Zoom and I couldn't get in. So <laughs> I have registered for this Thursday's coming up. And, um, but no, I think, um, I think inclusiveness and diversity really is, is really a great thing for this community. And, um, we really need to work hard and on that. So that's really all I have to say. Al? Thank you. Um, really, I didn't have too much on my uh, calendar board for this month, but uh, one thing I did learn is having my hat on and being the uh, uh, taxpayer uh, applying for permits and doing the whole procedure of hooking up the sewer, which was actually quite eye-opening, but uh, the system does work. Everything does go smoothly, and you just have to follow along the procedures and, uh, and the way it goes, but it does take time, and the uh, and, um, majority of the employees that we have working with us do a very good job. Good. Uh, we had FCSS meeting, which turned into strat planning, trying to get everybody together for that. So that was interesting to try to do through Zoom. Uh, both Misty and Paul did a really good job of organizing thoughts on some sticky note app that puts everything together. I'm not a big fan of not being in person for those kinds of meetings, but we do what we do. Uh, a couple other little meetings like mid-sized city mayors. <clears throat> Excuse me. We had Minister McIver on for that. He talked about the pandemic and lockdowns, comment that he's made a couple of times um, regarding the province's response to the pandemic and COVID-19 is that if it looks like they're scrambling and making it up as they go along, they absolutely are. Uh, we talked about the provincial policing review and the fact that Thank the you. province is looking at um, the switch to a provincial police force doesn't mean that it's a done deal. Uh, it could very well likely be on the municipal election as a referendum question. Uh, we talked about financial reserves in municipalities. A uh, few of the MLAs and ministers in the province have taken exception to um, municipalities having a huge reserve set up. Um, so they feel like municipalities might be overtaxing their residents. But then they say things like, well, why are you asking the province for grant funding? Why aren't you saving up for these 
expenditures that you know are coming. So I don't know that they know what they're talking about sometimes. Uh, I talked about homelessness and affordable housing. Um, he's encouraged all the municipalities to keep speaking out against or for that to get support. Um, and transit throughout all municipalities. It's not a big city issue. Um, so the smallers like us who offer transit to our uh, aging population or those with mobility issues should be part of the conversation and not just the Edmonton and Calgary's or the other cities over 100,000 people. So we'll continue to work with the provincial government. I uh, had a safe and healthy communities meeting on Friday. Uh, we had a presentation from Brian through victim services. Um, the victim, I oh, should send an email about this. The victim of crimes fund that was set up as a surcharge on tickets is seeing some changes through bill 16 where they might not be using funds from that to help the victims of crime. Uh, it could be allocated someplace else. So I'll send an email about that. And I think that was it. Thanks. Thank you, Kyler. Councillor Bill. Um, continuing work with the library as far as um, the new agreement with uh, the city of Latasquin. We're meeting once again tomorrow. Um, had two meetings that um, I'd like to give kudos to Paul. Uh, Tyler kind of touched on it, uh, both with the um, FCSS and also on the hub discussion on Friday. Uh, Paul, well done. You really kept things focused and I, I congratulate you on that job well done. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Thank you. Um, I haven't had any committee meetings as of, as of uh, recently, um, but I did attend the uh, hub task force meeting. And again, uh, like Councillor Billingsley said, uh, kudos to Paul because he really did facilitate, um, I think what could have been a very difficult meeting and, uh, and there was lots of open dialogue and discussion. And I think it's, uh, it's, it's his, facilitation of that meeting that that resulted in that kind of a meeting. So kudos to you. Thank you. Thank you. Are you Council Glass? Yeah, same as the rest of the councillors too. Um, Paul actually chaired the meeting for the diversity and inclusion task force this last time. And he did an absolutely incredible job with making sure that everybody was keeping on topic and coming up with some new topics of discussion as well that were kind of out of left field, but they were really good really, really good discussions that we had from that. Um, so yeah, absolutely, you're doing such a great job and we really appreciate you stepping in and chairing these meetings. But um, also for the CEC meetings that we've been having, um, we are having the team up to clean up this weekend and everything is kind of coming together on that. We're really excited because I think we had something around 123 volunteers uh, sign up for it. So it was kind of the more overwhelming experience response than we thought was going to happen so really excited for that this weekend and uh yeah the hub task force meetings have been great as well so um it's really good to just keep in the know of what's going on right now thank you uh Councilor Black. now i was uh i don't have much but i was at that hub meeting too and i think paul should go out and get some lottery tickets because he's been appraised by everybody so <laughs> <laughs> good job well done there thank you and if so, we'll move on to proposed city-owned building lease policy. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, Mayor Gandam and members of council. I'm here to present the proposed city-owned building lease policy. Um, so administration has recognized the need for policy to provide direction on how city-owned buildings are leased. Uh, currently, there are nine organizations utilizing space in city-owned buildings, um, and they bring in just over $260,000 annually. Uh, in the past, lease agreements have been handled on a case-by-case -case basis, with the final agreement coming to council for approval. The development of a policy would make the process more efficient and provide administration the ability to manage the agreements more effectively. Uh, some important highlights to note from the policy are organizations would be classified as either not-for-profit or for-profit organizations. 
Uh, so the not-for-profit organizations would be eligible for a lease rate that is 50% of market value and for-profit organizations would pay the appraised market value rate. Administration would retain a lease rate analysis once every five years for city facilities that currently have lease agreements with tenants. Uh, a lease rate analysis was complete for the multiplex in March 2021 due to all three tenants at that facility having leases that expire this year. Uh, so if approved, the three tenants at the multiplex, uh, Precision Gymnastics, Wetaskiwin Curling Club and Wetaskiwin Allied Arts and Crafts Centre, would see an increase to their lease rates. Um, administration would need to follow up with tenants at other city facilities, uh, which include the library, the civic buildings, the civic center by the Lake Park and Memorial Arts Center uh, to determine how approval of the policy would affect them. Uh, this policy would be implemented over three years to help mitigate any negative implications for the tenants. Um, if approved, Council would of course have the ability to make exceptions to this policy through Council resolution um, and also administration would be looking to engage the County of Wetaskiwin to see how this policy may impact the existing ICF agreement. Um, currently, facilities like the multiplex are not included in the ICF agreement. Uh, a few implications of this policy are as follows. Uh, so financial approval of the policy as written would result in an increase in revenue for city only spaces um, due to cur tenants currently paying below market value and non market value lease rates. Um, legal so administration has already obtained a lease template that would be suitable for the use that's outlined in the policy. Um, and then lastly, program and service. Uh, so approval of this policy as written could potentially result in current tenants being unable to pay the market appraised value for their lease space, uh, which may result in losing the ability to provide specific types of programming for the community. Uh, so those are kind of the important highlights of the policy. Uh, so at this time, I'd be happy to take uh, questions, feedback that you may have on the policy. Uh, Council Dean and then Lord Gardner. Uh, through the chair, Natasha, do the um, pro the profit for profit tenants do they pay any utilities on those um, spaces or just base rent? Yeah, through the chair to Councillor Billingsley, uh, they do not pay any utility cost that is covered by the city. Thank you. Through the chair to Natasha. Um, did we check out uh, other municipalities, what they're charging um, for the rec facilities? And um, compared to market value, like compared to market value of businesses, is this what we're comparing the square footage to? Uh, yeah, through the chair to Councillor Hillgartner. Um, so I did compare to about six other municipalities. Um, and when it comes to the uh, curling space specifically, many different municipalities just handle it differently. Uh, some rent um, the building for like a dollar a year and then the, the curling clubs are responsible for everything else. Um, and then a couple other municipalities like Camros do it very similar to us and lease the space for, um, yeah, a a fairly subsidized um, rate. Um, sorry, what was the second part of that question? Well, uh, just that you got, you're comparing it to market value. Um, mm -hmm. So is this compared to like businesses square footage or, or what is it compared to? Correct, so it would be um, appraised at market value, which would be, um, yeah, for curling and precision gymnastics, it was industrial space because that's what the space um, is kind of could be used for. And then for the arts and crafts center, it was um, retail space. So then I'm just trying to look at a fair way because you got so many different rates here. Um, and I can't figure out what minor hockey because it's it's so much. Well, you got six thousand square feet at five thousand per year. That's pretty cheap. Um, I'm just wondering if if we come up with a common ground on some of these non for profit groups, or is this how you work this out? 
Uh, yeah, through the chair. So I guess um, it just becomes difficult uh, to, to define what that common ground is for lease rates and what's, um, yeah, what, what works best for the tenant as, and for the city. Um, because right now without a policy, it's just very hard to go into these lease negotiations without having kind of some, some basis to go off of. Okay, I'm just trying to figure out this one here. Because that like, okay, for the curling club, we're going from three bucks to five, five dollars a square foot, uh, craft. So basic, well, the craft center is going to be doubled. <clears throat> I'm just wondering if we're allowing, because there's going to be some heavy increases coming up here for the end of the year. And this goes through. Yeah, so if this, if this policy uh, was to be approved, we would look at implementing it over three years to try and mitigate um, some of those because administration realizes um, there's some pretty uh, large increases. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Natasha, that's some, like some of these are over hundred percent. We're looking at the gymnastic or going from uh, $3 to $10. And then you got the curling club side by side. Now, some of these people have done renovations. If they were to pull out, do they, are they reimbursed for any renovations they've done or is that tenant uh, expense? Uh, yeah, through the chair to Councillor Branco, I do not believe they would be entitled to any reimbursement because it just would be considered um, a leasehold improvement, which becomes the property of this city. Um, yeah. But I'm thinking a lot of money for some groups who are struggling right now no money coming in no nothing mm -hmm. uh, an oddball question what if they said no what will we do with that building two buildings there with task and curling club and the gymnastic the fees for for operating them to their members would be phenomenally high yeah, through the chair to Councillor Branco, um, I suppose if that were to happen and they were unable to pay uh, the lease rate that uh, we approved, then it would mean that we would um, put that building um, up for offer to other groups, uh, which would be unfortunate, but it is a possibility, yes. Thank you, uh, Councillor Dean. Uh, Natasha, through the chair, um, I'm going to assume that they still are not at full cost recovery, even at these rates. Is that fair to say? Uh, through the chair to Councillor Billingsley, um, that's correct. So currently the multiplex is about 14% cost recovery. Thank you. Councillor uh, Mayor Tyler. With, so some of them are not-for-profit and then at the bottom with the Knights of Columbus Lions Club, um, we have to, or you wanna follow up with the tenants to determine the impacts. Like we change the rates on any of these, everybody's going to be impacted. Why would some of them have a follow-up but not all of them to work on that agreement? Uh, yeah, through the chair to Mayor Gandum. Um, for the Knights of Columbus, the Lions Club, um, those tenants, have been utilizing facilities uh, well prior to COVID, um, but they do not have current lease agreements with the city. Um, they were expired and then um, weren't followed up on. So um, we would need to reach out to see how they, they are impacted. Okay. And places like the Arts and Crafts Center and the Precision Gymnastics aren't currently paying anything because they're not able to operate due to COVID. That was a motion we passed a while ago, right? Uh, through the chair, yes, that is correct, um, except for Precision Gymnastics has been able to operate mm -hmm. kind of off and on. They aren't right now, but they were operating. Okay, and they, like, they made the decision to change from a not-for-profit to a, to a for-profit. So understanding that and how they're going to be operating the, the gymnastics club, that was on them, not 
not a change to their lease agreement by the city, but they changed how they operate. So I understand that's not subsidizing a for-profit tenant in any city building um, should happen anywhere. So I understand that and I appreciate it. Thank you. Councilor D. Nope. Oh, sorry, Wayne. Through the chair to Natasha. So it says policy implementation, it will be implemented over the course of three years. So I'm assuming that statement would imply that we would be reaching these numbers at the end of three years. Uh, through the chair to Councillor Nielsen, yes, that is correct. And would it be the also be the intention then to simply divide the increase by three so they know what's coming each of those three years? Uh, through the chair, yes, that is correct. Thank you. Uh, Natasha, would this include the football, the soccer, and the baseball uh, groups? Uh, through, the, through the chair, no, it would not because um, those groups don't actually have lease agreements with the city. Those would be more rental agreements, which are handled differently. Thank you. Any further questions for Natasha? <clears throat> So Natasha, if, even if we did over three years, I was just doing quick uh, um, calculations on the cooling rink. So in three years, we've got to hit 61.7% increase. Um, so that's like 20% increases each year. Um, and how long, he says here, how long we've been, when did the last, uh, expired this year's the expiry of the old one and it has been increased for three years or two years with task and growing club yeah through the chair so they have not seen a rate increase since 2018 19 um, ice season yeah. um, and their current lease expired in 2020 and they were put on a lease extension until this year okay. all right thank you Any further questions to our lease policy of city owned property? I think just a comment that while it does look like it's a substantial increase over the next three years, um, as Natasha pointed out, we've got a cost recovery of like 14%. So I guess it's just the deciding factor of council of how much we want to subsidize um, these organizations and, and the buildings that they occupy. And I, I think that's totally clear. We just got to make sure that all the um, people that rent our rec facilities, that it's on an equal basis. Not yeah. Not yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. No further questions, we'll move on to community safety policy priority discussion. Paul. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, I'm here today with our RCMP inspector, uh, Inspector Durant. Um, as you know, the uh, Wetaskiwin and Area Community Safety and Policing Priorities Survey was, uh, was, was held between February 19th and March 18th of this year. This was the third year that uh, the city has done this survey. The results of the survey were used to inform or will be used to inform policing priorities locally, as well as the city's overall community safety approach. Uh, the, the survey went out to city uh, members from City of Wetaskiwin, the County of Wetaskiwin, Town of Millet, County of Camrose. Um, demographic information uh, such as area of residence, age, group, occupation were collected and will be used to deepen the RCMP's understanding of which types of crimes are of significant concern. The RCMP also held a virtual town hall on March 4th of this year to provide an opportunity for community members to ask questions of the RCMP. Um, Inspector Durant has a presentation that he will go through here just briefly to provide an overview of the results of the survey and what the RCMP heard um, as they are trying to finalize the 2021 policing priorities. Um, once, once approved, um, today's presentation to the committee is to gather feedback uh, from the committee. Uh, the inspector will use this to help finalize the policing priorities, which he will bring back to council on May 25th for final approval. 
Once approved, the inspector will use this to report back on um, the priorities via the RCMP quarterly reports. So at this point in time, I'd like to hand the mic over to inspector. Good afternoon, Council. I'll just uh, quickly go through um, my presentation and then I have some uh, time at the end for some questions for you guys if you have any. Um, uh, as the eloquent Paul here was able to go and give that great introduction there on exactly what we did, this is the results of our annual performance plan uh, external partnership surveys and information gathering session to plan for this year's annual performance plan. As you may be aware, the annual performance plan, every detachment has to have one in, in the RCMP. Some larger uh, areas also have unit specific help, uh, performance plans. And what this does, it helps uh, myself and my team focus our policing resources and which area we need to concentrate our efforts based on external and also internal consultation. Um, on the, just to get us an, an idea where we are at, this is the results from last year, comparison from 2019 to 2020, persons crimes down over 7%, 7 property crime down 10%, other criminal code down 10%, and that was just for the year to year with an overall decrease in criminal code offenses by 10%. And just to have another look as we build, as my annual performance plan actually starts in April and moves through to the following March, um, we wanted to have a look at where we were at in this year itself, uh, January through March, we see an, an increase of 21% on persons crimes. Property crime is down 39%, other criminal code down is 40, overall criminal code uh, decreased by 32%. And also having a quick look at property crime, uh, as I mentioned in previous meetings, break and enters are down 60%. Theft of motor vehicle down 60% and uh, theft under $5,000 down 53%. So that just kind of gives us a benchmark and what those statistics show me is uh, we've been concentrating our efforts over the last several years on property crime as being one of the main drivers. We've talked about uh, the crime severity index and, and being able to uh, apply police resources to where we can have the most bang for buck when it comes to crime severity index and we did see that break and enters was one of those areas in which we could concentrate our efforts on and get as much uh, bang back on the crime severity index as we could. So as, you'll, as you've noticed, the property crime statistics are down and they're down uh, considerably compared to other communities in the area. And what that leads us to believe and based on analysis on our internal client uh, feedback from the other NCOs and my senior management team, we're looking to try and maybe perhaps pivot this year based on also some of the feedback we got from the community itself. So uh, by looking at those statistics, it kind of sets us up to have a look at this, uh, the external client surveys a little differently. So uh, as we mentioned, we had the town hall, uh, the results um, of the town hall weren't the best, the turnout wasn't great. I think we had initially 40 people logged into the Zoom meeting that we had, and then we lost a whole bunch and we had about 19 people stay with us throughout the meeting. As a result of that and some long discussions that we had, uh, three main themes came out as priorities for the community itself. And that was drugs, property crime, and vacancy and homelessness. Not surprising on those three. Uh, the drugs coming to the top of the pile over the last year is something that I'm seeing in both uh, the rural city and also in Camrose as well. So we're, we're trending along what other people are thinking as well in the other areas. So the results of the survey um, is uh, what I have next here. The surveys come out. We had 98 individuals respond to the survey and we had two business people apply to the survey. It was split down the middle, uh, demographics, female to male. Uh, there's a breakdown on this slide here of 21% agriculture, 16% business and 13% industry. And that was based on uh, what was your main, one of the questions was on the survey was what is your main occupation where you're farmer, are you uh, a business owner, that sort of thing, just to give us an idea of, of the dynamics of the people that are answering the questions. 
Um, in that survey, we also had uh, some results for CPOs since the same CPO question, similar CPO questions we had in the last year on where the CPOs should be spending their time. And it was based on a ranking of one to five. Um, the options were transient loitering panhandling, that was a two out of five. Provincial traffic enforcement, 2.48. Bylaw enforcement, 2.8. Protection of infrastructure, road band enforcement, overweight vehicles, 3.6 and photo radar enforcement 4.1. The results of the uh, crime priorities uh, is the next slide. And of that, uh, we were not surprised at what we saw on this. It was actually what we anticipated we were gonna see based on other surveys in the area. Illegal drug related offenses was, came out number one this year. Uh, crimes against person number two, that's the, the pink being the uh, drug related offenses, yellow being crimes against person, vagrancy being the kind of lime green, and then uh, property crime coming in uh, fourth uh, from on these priorities of this year, which is again, a little bit of a pivot from what we saw in the last couple of years where major and minor property crime was the main focus on the last couple of years. So as a result of the survey, uh, we also held a meeting with my NCOs and uh, other uh, managers inside the detachment. So we got a feel for what the external clients are telling us. Now we went internal to talk to our uh, policing staff on what they thought the priority should be. And this is a draft process that I put together so far on where we think our priorities should be spent. I've identified five priorities, which is at least one, if not maybe two more than I would have liked, but uh, because of the way the, the uh, priorities came out and the comments that we received, we wanted to put uh, uh, all of them in here that we came up with here. So first priority will be uh, drug enforcement. Uh, and underneath that priority, we have a couple of initiatives that we wanna push forward on that and completing judicial authorizations. We wanna complete at least uh, 12 search warrants this year. That's one a month. Um, and we also want to hold as many as 12 Intel sharing development sharing meetings, and that would be meetings with other police agencies or other Intel groups such as Musquachis or Camero City Police or uh, other district offices and sharing of intelligence in the area. Proactive enforcement, uh, we want to continue to work on drug traffickers inside the community. We've, uh, we've been working on that pretty significantly since the end of the year, uh, January, February, March. Uh, once we saw that the uh, property crime down was significantly starting in January, February, we actually pivoted on our own at the beginning going, okay, now we got to focus on other crime types that are starting to pop up. So we want to do as many as 60 trafficking investigations this year. That's going to be pretty much headed up by our crew team, but that's not to say that they have, they are the only ones that can be working on this. We'll have other members in the detachment that would like to take on some of this stuff as well. And so there may be even be some trafficking investigations or drug, drug work completed by the regular constables as well. Next will be prolific offender management. Uh, as we were looking at both pivoting away from property crime, we didn't want to leave property crime all by itself just to kind of start all over again. So what we're going to see is we also want to start working on person's crime, which is priority three. But in that we have a prolific, prolific offender management uh, process that we can use that has proven successful on property crime. We can use the same process in working with both person's crime and, and drug trafficking as well. So a prolific offender management is going to be front and center there. We did approximately 550 curfew checks last year. We want to push it up to at least 600. Again, those curfew checks are for those people that have been released on some sort of bail or some sort of uh, curfew. Uh, we will be actually actively checking on them. It's a very successful piece. Uh, warrantless blitzes and media outputs. We want to put a little more uh, piece into the media with regards to wanted persons persons of interest, things that we want to the community to help us with. Uh, so we're going to be working quite closely with our local media here to try and put out uh, more wanted bulletins, that sort of stuff. Again, that's going to help us with the person's crime as well as the property. Um, we're seeing just a slight uptick in and around the area. Some of our more uh, serious person's crimes that we've seen this last year does have some sort of gang influence on it. So as part of our prolific offender management, we're gonna be working as well as trying to identify which gang members are living within the community, which ones are traveling through, and then sharing that intelligence with our partners to the south, as well as within the detachment. 
Uh, part of that process is identifying these subjects as being a members of an organized gang. Um, where this comes in handy uh, after the fact is if we can identify someone as a member of, a, uh, of a, uh, an organized group and they're caught complete, uh, completing criminal code offenses, be it trafficking, be it a drive-by shooting, be it an assault, and it's in relation to um, gang-related activity, then we can lay, then lay an organized crime charge on that individual as well as any offenses that they are committing. So there's the importance of trying to uh, determine uh, the gang activity piece. Third priority is persons crimes. Uh, again, uh, prolific offender management will come to play there as well as we're working on a bear spray bylaw uh, that will be coming to you guys uh, shortly here. I think the end of this month, the 25th, I think we're bringing that forward. Um, that will in, in short, will outlaw bylaw inside, or sorry, outlaw bear spray being in possession of inside the city of Wetaskiwin. Um, there'll be a degree of officer discretion with that. Uh, but uh, generally speaking, we do have a significant number of offenses, uh, our assault with a weapon offenses in the city is actually bear spraying. So we're going to uh, in, have you guys have a look at a bylaw this year to see if we can move that forward. The other piece is, and this is gonna be a little bit COVID specific, is an education program with regards to weapons and guns. And again, that's just gonna be public awareness, uh, information sharing with regards to that. Um, one of the big pieces on that is going to be we're seeing a lot some B and E's in the rural area where they're actually targeting for firearms. Uh, so we want this one here is more specific to the rural than the city itself, but the messaging is still quite clear. You want to make sure your firearms are properly uh, stored and locked up. Fourth priority property crime uh, pawn shop bylaw that we were just here with you guys here just a little while ago for first and second reading. We're going to move that forward along with partnership with uh, Trent and his CPOs. One of the other things that we saw on the criminal code side that was is under other criminal code trending upwards was uh, fraud was was frauds, uh, mostly online phone scams, uh, Kijiji frauds, things like that. And we want to be doing some presentations in reference to not being a victim and just understanding that uh, frauds is an opportunistic kind of thing. If you engage on these folks and you bite on the bait, then you end up losing your money. So. Uh, with two cadets coming here, one next week and one the following week after that, this is a very, very good project for our new members to take on. They have to take on some sort of community project as part of their six months recruit field training. So this is one we're going to have them pilot for us. Again, this is going to be COVID specific. I'd really like to get into the uh, retirement homes and things like that and do face-to-face -face presentations. But again, COVID is going to kind of limit that. So we're going to have to do some thinking on how we're going to roll a couple of these public public pieces out, but we will continue to look at that and move it forward. Um, last community engagement, it, it was one that was in last year's and I think it's important that uh, we get out in the community and partake in as many events as we can. Some of these are more is gear, are geared to the, to the county as well. And again, these five are encompassing not only the city, but the rural and also Camrose area that we're also responsible for. And then it's a blend. So you'll see community events, lock it or lose it, drug talks, septed. Um, in the rural side, more boat patrols, uh, social media enhancement. I want to work with the city and also the county to see if we can get some sort of Twitter page going or Facebook page. Um, as you can imagine, I think I've mentioned it before, I'd really like to do a little more in social media on getting information out to the public, but we're a little bit limited on what we can do as far as having our own Facebook page. As soon as the RCMP has some sort of Twitter or Facebook page, it has to go all the way up through Ottawa and it has to be approved across the country and it has to be bilingual and it has to have all these rules and boat anchors that really hinder us. So we would be looking to the city and or the county to help maybe partnership on that and uh, put out a group page uh, to some sort. Uh, and then downtown foot patrols, uh, 250 uh, is what I'm kind of shooting for as a goal there. We've already done 150 in, since February uh, and pending you know, what the results are this afternoon, that number may go significantly higher or it may be around that 250 mark. Uh, that's the rapid fire round on our annual performance plan. If there's something here, if you have any questions, by all means, fly away. A lot of them are proven tactics that we used last year, specifically the, the uh, prolific offender management, really looking at the drug side of things of really focusing down on the drug investigations and 
then concentrating our intel gathering towards that as well. So uh, I'm really hoping that we'll do the, use some of the same techniques that we use to drive down the break and enters over the last couple of years. We're going to use the same thing on the uh, drug trafficking side of things. And I'll answer any questions you have. Uh, Keith, I got a question. How much man hour do you spend in the hospital? 5,000, 10,000? Man hour type, uh, member hours? Yeah. Wow. Uh, I could get back to you with an estimate, Joe. I don't have that number off the top of my head. And, and, if, and if you also could bring back how much you spend down in Muskegon. We, we, we spend we spend very little we spend very little time in Muskogee's. Now, okay, forget Muskogee. Trafficking, no, not trafficking. Uh, highway patrol is like speeding on highways. Is that covered by that? Sometimes uh, there is a traffic unit that works out of our detachment and an integrated traffic unit uh, pays rent at your detachment. Okay, no, no, I mean, do we pay for that? I'm going out highway there is a portion there is a portion that you pay pay to through the through uh, the shared costs that goes to that piece it's your provincial it's your provincial piece that you pay for goes to that but on the traffic side of things we do have a traffic unit that does all the local highways and byways around here and it's a shared unit 50 50 with the sheriffs and rcmp it's a 12 12 member unit Kevin? Sure to chair to Inspector Durant. Um, thank you for your presentation. And as we're looking at crimes overall going down, and I see persons crimes going up yes. kind of rapidly. Now, I, I know we've kind of been through this before, but if you could just walk me kind of through exactly what persons crimes are. Okay, we are so persons crimes, persons crimes are things like homicides, Offenses related to death, robbery, sexual assaults, other sexual offenses, assaults, kidnapping, hostages, abductions, extortion, criminal harassment, and uttering threats. So more or less, it's a crime that's created or, or committed to a person. Okay, Property crime, you have something stolen, something gets missing, something gets damaged, that's a property crime. Okay, thank you. Now, do you have any idea why it's up so much Okay, as, as other crimes have gone down? Yeah, and, and I had a look at this, uh, I've had a look at this over the last couple of months and what we're seeing, and I think I mentioned back when COVID first started here this time last year, yeah. and then around the summer, I was actually waiting to, for this statistic to start to go up. And it, it, it's in relation to domestic violence yeah. and partnership squabbles. Uh, I see assaults are up 15, criminal harassment is, bear with me. <laughs> I don't need the exact numbers, sir. No, nope, but it, 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 it's good context, right? It's a good yes, question. 15% yes. uh, assaults, criminal harassment up 145%. So it's gone from 11 calls to 27 calls yeah. and uttering threats is up 89%. So this tells me people are fighting, arguing, saying things they shouldn't say to each other and there's some assaulting going on there. So overall person's crimes up 21% because of those three. Everything else is down and down significant. These are the only three drivers so this tells me in my analysis is that it's a domestic type partnership, people being penned up, stress because of not working, all those types of social pressures, it's starting to have an effect on the person's crime side of things. Okay, thank you, I appreciate that. Okay. Wayne? Thank you. Through the chair to Keith. Um, when you talk about gang cards, what does that mean? Okay. 50 gang cards. We had we have an intelligence gathering card that will have, a, and I don't want to be, it's like carding, but not carding as in, we do it as an intelligence gathering piece after the fact. So if we have a dealing with someone, we get their name and where they live, their date of birth. And then there's a few check boxes on there with regards to, um, was their activity gang related? Were they standing on the corner flashing gang signs and either assaulting another group or something to that effect? Have they self-identified themselves as a member of the Red Alert or Indian Posse or whatever, right? Have they, have they said that I'm a member of Hell's Angels, right? So there's a box, checkbox for that on there. Um, is there an intelligence 
information that's come in that says that this person is a member of an organized gang. Are they, do they have gang tattoos? Are they wearing gang colors? Are they, there's all these different boxes to check off. Is, and one of them actually is, is a finding in court that's saying you're a member of a gang. All of those indicators, right, bring us to believe that that person is a, an affiliated gang member. Where it gets tough on when we're working with these gang cards, and it's just, it's, it's an intelligent gathering data is just to say, okay, ultimately this guy has eight of the nine boxes filled. Well, we can say that this guy is now a gang member. He still has to be qualified as a gang member in the court of law. When we go to charge him, and if there's a gang related charge that goes along with that, then we still have to prove that he's a member of an organized gang. But this, what this card is, is just, okay, we have a card, we can check off that based on a traffic stop or based on a call for service that we've gone to, we've gleaned out this intelligence and are tracking it on that particular person. Ultimately, that then goes into our intelligence piece to say, okay, now where do we go with that person, right? Great, thank you. My next question is in relation to, um, and you mentioned Red Alert and the posse. Sure. Uh, local, criminal, regional, provincial. Sure, all of that. Um, historically, <clears throat> I can go back to when I was in charge of the gang unit in Muscogee back in 2006 through 2009. We had, depending on the gang, there was three different levels. So back in those days, Indian Posse is not as big as it once was, but we used to have national members pop into town from time to time. We had provincial members and we had local members of the Indian Posse. I don't see it being any different in our area with regards to either Red Alert or that sort of stuff. We have other groups that have now taken over from the Indian Posse. We're talking, well, we're talking over 10 years ago now when I was in charge there. It's now kind of switched, it's ASAP and a couple of other different groups, Red Alert being one of them. Um, and depending on how, which group you're dealing with and which individuals you're dealing with, and this is the confusing part on the, on the gang situation in our area, you will see members of an organized group that will hang out together and do crime together and they're, they're, they're your atypical gang related activity. But you can also, we can also see where we'll do a traffic stop and you'll have one cousin that belongs to one gang and you'll have another cousin that belongs to another gang. And in a normal circumstance, these two guys should never be in a car together. They shouldn't even be on the same block together, but for whatever reason, they're in the car. So their family ties or their family relationships can at times supersede. And this is where it gets confusing. You just can't say that these two guys are rolling together and the driver is a red alert guy. You can't assume that the guy next to him is a red alert. It could be just his cousin and he's not a member. Right? And that's where you, we have to be careful that we don't paint everybody with the same brush. But that guy could also be an ASAP member, but because they're cousins and he needed a ride to town, he's willing to give them a ride and they put their differences aside. Okay, thank so, you. Oh, sorry, go so we, we will have, and, and that's where the local membership of this are very loose. They're, they're very hard to kind of nail down. Um, just because a guy's wearing red sneakers and a red jacket and that sort of stuff doesn't necessarily mean he's a red alert, right? It could be that he just likes the color red. But it's all the other things that come along with it, the tattoos and the gang signs and, you know, hanging with these guys and maybe getting caught spray painting a red alert logo or he's got red alert logos on his stuff. Uh, all this goes into a full intelligence picture. Thank but that you. being said, the provincial levels of Red Alert will be have local members of Red Alert here that they will work with or and or ask to do bidding for from time to time. So back to your original question, provincial and local membership will be in, in and around the area. So then in terms of gang taggings, right? Um, is it safe to assume if I go out and start painting red alert emblems all over town, would right. they take exception to that? Who, the red alert? Yeah. Mm, they may, especially if you're not doing it right. There's a certain way of doing it. You don't just go red alert or RA. It's gotta be a RA in a certain format. I guess what I'm leading up to here is, is that as we see some more of the, the tagging. Sure. Um, it's safe to assume that it is likely 
members? Or want to be. Okay, thank you. Through the chair, with our media releases that you do, is that part of your RCMP budget? Do the, does the paper do that for you for free? A little bit of both. Yeah. If the story's good, they'll run it for free. If I ask them to run a advertisement for a town hall, that cost, you, cost me some money out of a budget. Right? And how do you know the, how do you know how effective it is? Like whether it's social media or print media, how do you know that it's effective if you've posted about a missing person or a crime that you're looking for information on? Well, it's slightly different. Like if we were looking at a missing person and it was something urgent, it would go into a Twitter form. We actually have a K division Twitter page, you know, that we can get in touch with. So we had a missing girl here a few months back, uh, February, I think it was. And um, that was one of the big pieces that we wanted to get it out to the local media and the local media and also provincial media are really good about picking up. They know the importance of those things. It doesn't take us long stuff something in the fax machine or put it on the put it on the, uh, get it up on the web and we get in touch with our, like we were in touch with our K division Stratcoms people like right away uh, when that file started to roll out and saying, okay, well, we got to get, get it in the paper, get it out, get it on the media, leave it there on the front page until such time as we find this little girl, right? So in those particular cases, there's no charge for that. We just send out a media release and the pick, pick excuse me, the paper will pick it up or the local media will pick it up and we'll go from there. Um, so depending on the news day, depends if the excited states did something big that day. Sometimes they pick our stuff up right away and sometimes they don't. Uh, but they're usually pretty good. When it's important, they'll get it out there. So good cooperation. Like they're, yeah, support. they're pretty good. Yeah, very good. And sometimes it just doesn't meet the threshold, right? It doesn't quite make the, doesn't not kind exciting of, exciting enough. You know, thank goodness Trump, Trump's not in office anymore because he used to take home. <laughs> we always said that, okay, as long as Trump doesn't say nothing, this will hit the page. Councillor <laughs> Black. So you touched on this a little bit with Kevin's question surrounding persons' crimes yep. increasing. Um, you were talking about domestic violence has been increasing significantly. Would you say that this has increased a lot more in the past few months than it ever has since the beginning of COVID? I'd have to go back and do a quarterly analysis. And, and I, we, we really don't go back unless we, we see, say, we get to the third quarter and all of a sudden we saw um, things really kind of shoot up. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I want to go back and, say, and have a look and say, okay, well, when did it start? And usually I can go back through a few months, a couple of different months of our thing, and all of a sudden I see where the jump took off. Similar to the, the, the request that uh, Mr. Nielsen had last year with regards to kind of doing a rundown, crunch down on, on the domestics themselves, uh, it'd be hard for me to comment on when it kind of, I think it's come up, come in the last since Christmas, it's really kind of to start to pick up again. Mm -hmm. uh, you look at uh, the statistics overall, person's crimes was down last year, yeah. but now since January, it's pumped up. So just a quick guess, since Christmas, January, it started to pick up. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's not up significant, like it's, although it says it's up, uh, what is it, 20, 20 something percent. Mm -hmm. When the numbers are small, <laughs> and they go up by four or five, they can go up significant. It looks like they're going up significantly, but it's just an extra four or five files or six files, yeah. so to speak. Okay. And sort of in relation to that, um, under the different priorities, there was persons crimes and underneath that there's bear spray bylaw and the education program with weapons and guns. Yeah. And I was wondering if there's going to be any sort of programs related to domestic violence that may come from this as well, seeing as how that's most of the persons crimes that have increased. We, we can look at that to see what sort of uh, information stuff we can get out. Uh, there's no issues. I'm sure we've got lots of stuff out of K Division Stratcoms that we can put into that. So. Absolutely. Thank you. But what, just I'll just temper that with as soon as you put something like that, everybody starts reporting and then the stats really go high. <laughs> Which is good though. Yep, yep. <laughs> they need to learn to yep. um, report those types of things and know that it's safe to do so. Uh, through the chair to Inspector Durant. Um, I know we've had this conversation before and, and um, 
I brought it up with yourself and uh, Curtis Sablocki. I see a, a huge problem in this town with um, young people on bikes with backpacks and hoodies that maybe I'm wrong, maybe I'm not. I believe they're feeding our drug trade. Now, I was told at one point in time that we really can't pull them over without a reason. Now, when I'm driving a vehicle, you can pull me over anytime without a reason. Demand a breathalyzer and a net. Is, is that still the case? Because I, I really, really do believe that those people are the biggest part of our crime in town. Sorry, and I missed the middle part. Guys on bikes and backpacks and hoodies yes. are, are the main drivers and can we stop them? I think they should be because I do. Yes, we can stop them. So you if can? that's your question. Okay. They can be stopped, they can be checked. Okay. Right? And is uh, that going on? From time to time, yes. Um, okay. it's, it's, it comes down to a thing of if the members see them and they don't have a light on their bike and it's dark, Perfect. that's a reason to stop them. Okay. If they don't stop at a stop sign, that's a reason to stop them. If they're not riding on the right-hand side of the road in the flow of traffic, then they're against the Highway Traffic Act. You can stop them. It doesn't matter their age, right? What we have to be careful of is what the member says the stop is for. And this goes to carding, it goes to everything else and saying, well, I just want to know who you are. Why? Well, you're a good check. Wrong. That just gets, that goes down into a charter argument so quickly. You don't want to go there. But I urge my members to have a reason, have a statutory reason to stop and talk to somebody. Then you have the right to ask them who they are, identify them. And a lot of kids, they don't carry drivers, they don't have driver's licenses and they don't carry ID. So sometimes you have to be creative on how you determine yeah. on positively identifying them. But there's no reason why you can't stop. It's just like anybody, if I follow a vehicle for two or, two or three blocks, I'll find a reason eventually to pull them over and have a statutory reason for that. Good, good. I appreciate that because that was, going to be one of my comments as well is if they don't have a light on their bike if they don't if they're not wearing a helmet under a certain age yep i think these people should be checked and yep. and you know what i don't i don't think a lot of people really believe that that these people really do feed the people up here yep i've seen the i've seen the crime firsthand that they do at my work at home hardware right and uh no i appreciate your answer thank you they're also strategically quick too oh yes they and, are. and you can lose them quick especially if they know where they're going yeah i'm not strategically quick anymore so yeah i, <laughs> I can't drive our police cars through people's yards like they can ride their bikes through yards yeah i know <laughs> yes, thank sir. you for your answer sir yeah so chief a word you just said there kind of kind of puts my head in the line we can you can stop a vehicle driving on the highway without nothing wrong but you said you will find a thing find a thing i'll explain to you this someone rolls a stop sign okay there has to be a statutory there, the the highway traffic act allows me to stop any vehicle anytime and ask for a driver's license vehicle registration insurance okay most case law says that's not that's that could be construed as uh, an arbitrary stop if we if so be it so what we want to do when we doing our traffic enforcement is ensuring that we have a statutory reason for the stop speed weaving in the center lane driving left of center not driving in the center of the marked lane rolling a stop sign uh, failing to signal the left or right fail to signal a turn um, what i please please don't interpret me as just randomly stopping people willy-nilly we should have a reason for the stop to start with what we go from after that and the importance of that is if that stop all of a sudden turns into another investigation you want to be solid on what the stop was for to start with because you don't want to lose everything you find all the stolen property in the trunk or in the back seat or whatever the case may be because it's an arbitrary stop does that answer your question? Yes, it does. But that also, as my colleague here said, uh, talking with the, the people with backpacks, 90% of the people on bicycles in our community drive their bikes on the sidewalk or right through a uh, side, uh, sidewalk cross. And that's illegal because you're supposed to dismount. Yep. So that's a good reason for you to do it. But Could be. That, that could be the reason. 
Um, how many bikes actually stay on the right hand side of the road? How many cut corners? How many, how many of forbid put their arm out like this and actually come to a stop at a stop sign? Sure wasn't me my entire childhood. <laughs> me either. Uh, through the chair to council, I just want to remind everyone when I was in front of you two months ago talking about the priorities, uh, your direction to Keith, this is that opportunity and the only thing I've heard today that you would like Keith to consider to report on other than what he has spoken about is the potential for domestic violence programs. So I just wanted to make that connection so that you all knew these were the things Keith would be reporting on and Paul's going to be working with him on metrics on how we can say these programs have related to a reduction in crime in these areas. So if you had any other thoughts based on our meeting a couple months ago, now is your time to put those in front of Keith so that we could go away and try to figure out how that fits into his program. Go ahead, sir. I got a question. Now, with medical marijuana out there, uh, you probably know more than I do because you've had some a lot of people growing medical marijuana that besides besides that any uh, investigation or anything into those who because you obviously know those who have a medical license to produce it yep uh, you see any it's uh, really not it's hard it's hard for you guys because they got a government if there's a if there's a clear clear violation of the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act with relation to marijuana and the Gaming and Liquor Act and Marijuana Act, then we will look at that and we will enforce that act. Um, there's still, for example, there's still illegal grow operations throughout the province and there's Quonsets full of illegally grown marijuana still, even though they legalized it. So that wouldn't bar us from doing an investigation into trafficking in relation to marijuana. Where we're seeing our concerns in Wetaskiwin is with regards to methamphetamine, fentanyl, and cocaine. So although there's still a lot of acts that somebody can get themselves in trouble with with regards to CDSA, and we did see a slight increase in CDSA charges this year in our area, but that is in relation to um, marijuana in access to a driver of a vehicle. So they got their baggie in the center console, that's with an access, just like having the open beer in the center console of your car, right? Exactly the same rules apply. So we did see a little uptick in that particular area and we took some enforcement. And it was most of that is your local traffic unit doing that on the highways and byways inside the community and around the area here. But if someone's growing plants in their basement and they've got more than the four that are allowed and they don't have a proper permit or whatever, then we will take action against that. Again, it's, it, it's which, which one takes the priority, right? You know, the fentanyl dealer or the guy that has six plants and not four? Through the chair to Keith. Is there any time delay when our bylaw people have somebody contained um, for uh, RCMP to wait to see if they can handle the situation? Sorry, say that again, sir. <clears throat> Pertain our bylaw, when they have somebody contained for right. mischief, drunkenness and stuff, is there a procedure with the RCMP for them to sit back to wait to see if they can handle it? No, uh, other than if uh, CPO has someone stopped on the side of the road, I might stop and give them a nod, or I would drive by and say, roll the window down and say, are you all good? And yeah, I'm good. And then I'll, I'll carry on with my business, right? Yeah. Um, there's no policy or time or anything like that. In, in more so, it's work in partnership with. Uh, we do our foot patrols with a bylaw officer or CPO and RCMP member, mm -hmm. right? And we'll just, if you can handle it, great. If not, I'll handle it. Uh, there are mm -hmm. some, there are some things where uh, some charges under the bylaw and writing bylaw tickets that we just leave it to Trent and his guys to take care of because that's what they do. Yeah. Um, even in all the years of service I have in Wetaskiwin, I think I've only written two or three bylaw tickets in the whole time I've been here. Yeah. Uh, that's, the, you know, and likewise, if, you know, they have something that we want to take on, we'll take it on. But it's a partnership thing, not so much a, 
yeah, I'm going to wait until you get knocked on the ground and then we'll go over and help you. That doesn't, that doesn't okay. wash. No, I just, uh, I, I just noticed one incident, uh, it was a week ago Sunday at McDonald's where our bylaw was detaining a drunken person outside and he was, he didn't want to go with them or move away from the building. And uh, just by chance, I picked up a coffee. So I just sat in the park a lot to see what was happening. And uh, an unmarked patrol car pulled up beside me and sat there five minutes waiting too to see what was gonna happen mm. before he, they went. So I don't know what the situation, it could be just a one-off, but that's, that's the reason why I asked you that question. You don't want to step on anybody's toes, but you don't want to. No, don't I want don't. anybody to get hurt. They did. Either, right? He did pull up, and they did apprehend the guy and sure. you know, take him away. But I just wanted to make sure there was no policy. Out no, there. no policy. Okay. Thank you. No. Um, Kevin, you had spoke about um, these backpack hoodie people. Is this, Keith, is this a gang issue? I, I'm not familiar with it, so I have no idea. Not that I'm aware of, like there's no, the hoodie buddy the bike, bike gang. Yeah. Could one of these guys be a gang member? Sure. Uh, less likely perhaps, uh, not, not necessarily a high level gang member. He's gonna be in his own vehicle with his people and that sort of stuff, right? But is there a little bit of organized crime going on i mean in that in the loosest term of two or three guys going out and maybe checking a few door handles and that sort of stuff at night sure um most of the most of the bikes i see around are solo like there's the odd one that has two or three groups maybe a group of two or three but usually it's one person on a bike is what i see in the community so uh but nothing and have you uh, not that i'm aware of there's in, there's not an organized uh b and &E bike bike crew out there doing that could be could be wrong could be a whole bunch of them don't know but then has the detachment or yourself identified this as a, a problem in our community and if you have is it something that we as a council should give direction to with with the amount of property crime is down over the last little while i would I would, uh, I continue to tell the members and, and tell the NCOs, listen, get your guys on top of those guys with the bikes in the middle of the night. They're the ones that are gonna have stolen property in their backpacks. It's more of a strategic when and where than a, okay, let's get all the bikes out and let's get all our cops with lights and all that sort of stuff and go around and see if we can catch all these kids on bikes. If we see, Say for example, if petty theft was going up or theft from motor vehicle was going up and considerably going up and everything else was going down, then I would suggest that, yep, we got, still got a problem with minor property crime and we need to get on top of that. We are not seeing that. In fact, 60, 70, you know, upper, well plus 55 to 60% of property crime is down, including theft from motor vehicles, shoplifting, break and enters, uh, the only one that kind of is staying kind of true is the, the theft over 5,000. So that's still uh, still there. Uh, it hasn't had the, the big drop off, but that's more so the organized crime group stealing large items, that sort of stuff. But that talks about percentages. If you had 100 um, uh, vehicle thefts and, it, and now you have 70, well, that's a reasonable uh, or not, a, it, it's a big drop. Right. But you still have 70. Sure. Right. Whereas, and, and please, I don't want to uh, make light of this, but if you have three domestic violence um, situations and it goes down to, or it goes up to four. Right. Um, it's gone up 25%, but we're only talking four situations. And I'm not trying to make light of domestic violence at all, but you can see where you still have 70 Sure. Even though it's dropped by a considerable amount of percentage. Rate. Right. Absolutely correct, sir. There's still going to be crime out there. There's still going to be, but when you see what we're seeing and we're seeing the violent person's crime, it's substance abuse driven, things like that. What we're doing is we just, we're focused, we focused down for several years on break and enters and crime. Because when I looked at the numbers going, okay, 
I know some of the strategies that I can apply with my people. We can get everybody on the same page. I know prolific offender management, some real good driven intel on break and enters. We can, we can drop that. When I'm looking at the crime severity index and I'm looking at how I drop the CSI in Wetaskiwin and being able to get some quick wins and get some runs on the board in our favor, property crime was where we wanted to focus our efforts the most at the beginning is to drive down the break and enters because they carried the highest crime severity index of all the ones that they, they study other than homicide and that sort of thing. So now that we've seen a change in property crime, and that's why I mentioned in your property crime is still there. It's just priority four out of five. Polypic offender management is still number two. We're going to be doing that with our person's crimes. We're going to be doing that with the drug dealers. We're going to be doing that with the break and enter stuff. So the last thing I want to do is step my foot off the gas on property crime, right? And then let that take off again. We're all we're doing is pivoting slightly and putting drug enforcement up front. What we were finding as we were doing the drug, the, the break and enter investigations and hitting some of the property crime because property crime and drugs go hand in hand. We were finding opportunities to write search warrants under the drug the CDSA, as well as a search warrant. We were going in and we we're finding all the stolen property, but we were also finding a whole bunch of drugs and stuff like that too. So all we're doing is pivoting slightly to put drugs up front and to continue to focus on persons and property crime as well. But we're just slightly pivoting to say, okay, we're gonna make a constituted effort to try and get as much intel as we can on the dealers in town. We've had several close calls on overdoses on fentanyl, and we want to get those dealers if we can and get them pushed out of the city. So all we're doing is pivoting slightly. Doesn't mean we're not going to still stop the guys on the bikes. We're not going to, you know, continue to look at break and enters and keep a very, I'm keeping a very close eye on break and enters because I don't want them to start coming back up again. So to follow up then, uh, the results of the survey where it had uh, the rankings, the transient loitering, panhandling at 2.01. So are you then going to be using this as your guide? Like, obviously that was um, showing as being what the community believed to be the most, the biggest priority. Sure. So are you going to fall, is the intention then is to follow this? The intentions on that is, it is telling me, this is this public survey, the drug related offenses are still number, is number one to them. It's number one to me. It's number one to most of my investigators going, hey boss, we've done some real good work on property crime. Now we got to switch gears and we got to focus down on the drug dealers. And I don't disagree with that assessment. Uh, person's crimes, still one of those big things in the city here. And it's drug driven, it's relationship driven, you name it, it's, it's driven. Um, vagrancy is still there. What do we do with the hub? How does that continue to support the vagrancy and the homeless piece in the community, right? Again, we've had that in place for quite some time here over the hit on and off over the last couple of years. Um, I don't want to get too far down the rabbit hole for after four o'clock, <laughs> but um, it's still a focus for us. The focus of the, the, the of of people's perceived unsafety around the hub is still a focus of mine to try and find the exact uh, process or the exact crime reduction strategy that I need in order to make people feel safer, right? Um, so, but to say, okay, Keith, go do something about the vagrancy and the, and the substance abuse in this, well, I should have done that 40 years ago, right? And it comes back down to, if I could police my way through that, they would have been done decades ago. 2005, I was around this town, walk, driving around with all my constables and we were arresting everybody who had liquor on their breath. We'd put them in jail, we'd charge them and we'd charge them and we'd charge them and it didn't have the desired effect. Again, it's on here, it's fo our focus, but we don't have a specific strategy how we're gonna, we're already supporting the hub all over the place. We are already supporting the drug and diversion process that we have going as trying to deal with some of the worst offenders in that area uh, in the city. Uh, we are gonna continue to focus on supporting those programs and supporting getting these people into help. I think it was Desmond Tutu said, um, at one point in time, we gotta stop pulling people out of the river, walk up stream and find out why they're falling in. 
So then I guess to what Suits um, had said that, you know, this is our time. So I guess it, what I'd like to know is like if, if domestic violence obviously is an issue. Um, so does that mean it wasn't an issue before or it wasn't a focal? So what else isn't a focal? Like I could say, well, I think it should be uh, the backpack guys, or I think it should be open drinking, or I think it should be uh, people not coming to complete stop at stop signs, whatever that is. Yep. I don't know if I have enough information in front of me to be able to say what you're focusing on it, but I think it should be stop signs or I think it should be domestic violence, or I think it should be public drinking. I, do, I, I don't know what your priorities are that I think you're missing. That's why the priorities that I do have here, the five, those are the ones that I've identified as where we should be focusing, okay? So, so then what you're saying then, um, the loitering is your number one priority? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then I then I don't understand what your priorities are. Okay, Every, everything can't be a priority. But okay. they could be ranked. They should, well, yeah, within reason. Okay. I can't put 15 priorities on my annual performance plan. Okay. This thing's a beast to manage just with four. Uh, I added a second one on just because I think it's a fifth one on because I think it's important that it needs to be there. Okay. Right? I can put, if you, it absolutely has to be, and everybody in this room said, vagrancy has to be as a priority, then I'll have to put it on as a priority. And I'll have to find a way, but it's not just putting it as a priority. What is an initiative that we haven't done already that's going to drive down that? Sure. So it's not just that identifying it as a priority, you have to identify it as a priority, and then you have to find initiatives underneath the priority that are gonna have some sort of effect on pulling that number down. A solution. A solution, yeah or at least a good college try of a solution to say, and historical, hey, we've tried these three things before we had the divide. Just like prolific offender management, you can put prolific offender management into domestic violence. We already do that. If we have five or six couples that we're dealing with all the time, we will start putting in prolific offender management into domestic violence. It's a proven crime reduction strategy, right? We can do it in drug enforcement. We can do it in property crime, right? That's why we say we keep it at a higher level. We say prolific offender management is gonna be an overarching priority for us, be it whatever category of, of uh, if we see a run on bikey hoodie guys, we don't just turn, we just don't say, oh, it's not on our priority list. We just go like this and drive by. The corporals tell me, the members on the road say, hey boss, I have lunch with my constables all the time. Hey, you know what we're seeing? We're seeing X, Y, Z as a crime that's really kind of taken off. I said, well, what can we do about that? I put it back on them. What are you, well, what are you doing about that? Well, you know, I tried to write in a few tickets, but you know, the Crown wasn't real supportive of that. So uh, I think we got to think of something else. Hmm, good idea. What do you think we should do? I got some ideas, but I want to see what they're going to come up with. So just because something isn't in our top five doesn't mean that we can't address it. Just because if something emerges all of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden now we've got an issue over here. Well, we will then pivot and we will address that as a, as a crime reduction if we need to do that. Does that answer your <laughs> answer? Kind of, maybe it doesn't quite But I'm cover. still to the point where I don't know what you're missing. Like, the best one was is the uh, domestic abuse. That, sure. That, but I don't know what else is necessarily there or what's not there that we think should be a priority or discussion. I, I guess the safest way for me to say it is the vagrancy homeless situation with Tasquin is going to be one of our priorities regardless of whether it's your top five or not. We will continue to support any program, any enforcement action that we need to take, partnership with the city, partnership with the CPOs, partnership with the province, partnership with the open door. We will be there to help and push this problem down. 
whether we already know it's number one, there's no almost number one in the city at this particular juncture. I get that. But again, we also, if we're going to make it a priority, okay, we'll make it a priority, but we need to have some remedies that we can put or some initiatives that we can put underneath that priority in order for us to start tracking it. Okay. Uh, through the chair to Inspector Durant's. Um, Thank you. And, you know, I get so many people in this community speaking to me, and I think it's because I grew up on the streets of this community. And, and you know what? I don't, I don't pretend to be anything else. And I get a lot of complaints. And my first question is as well, did you phone the OCMP? And quite often it is no. And, you know, we had a discussion just before this meeting, and I will try to get some some facts on that now is there anything as a council that we can do and you were talking about social media what can we do to get the word out for everybody to make that phone call everybody should be allowed to make that phone call but for some reason people seem to be scared and and i'm not the guy to be getting a hold of i'd rather have you in their back area than me but <laughs> We'd have to drill down and try and find out why people aren't phoning. Yes. And I think it's a mixture of a bunch of things. And we've all talked about it here. Yeah. I don't want to be a rat. I don't want to be the next target. People's fear that, oh, if I, they think that if they phone, that we walk over and say, yeah, your neighbor called and he wants you charged with X, Y, Z. Yes. We don't walk in with that. Well, at least we shouldn't walk in. I'm not saying we don't, but right. we shouldn't walk in with that being our open, opening salvo. It should be, ah, I see you're breaking the law. Why are you doing that? Right. right? Yeah. Now, sometimes it's, I don't want to stay on hold for 25 minutes. Well, that's a capacity piece, somewhat beyond my control, although I can continue to push that piece. Yeah. But one of the biggest things is, is people have become complacent with the fact and maybe a little fed up with the overall justice system, including us, Yes. that I'm going to call and nothing's going to, you know, unless we drag them into the middle of town square and give them a public beating, people aren't going to be happy. Well, that's not our society today. Yes. Um, I go back to what we were talking about enforcement earlier. We would arrest, we charge, we arrest, we charge, we arrest, we charge. Eventually the judicial system just kind of gave up on us. There wasn't any system in place in the remand center for these people to get the help that they needed at the time. As much as, and I, we will agree with, visibility helps with perception. I'm not gonna say it doesn't, but as far as enforcement goes, trying to arrest these people and, and, and police our way through this, it's an uphill sled mm -hmm. with very slim results. My push, my, my comment to council would be every time you get a complaint from someone about something, the first words you should be saying is, did you call the members or did you call bylaw? Yes. And I've run into this a couple of times in the last couple of weeks. If you called, when did you call and who'd you speak to? Oh, I just talked to a guy in Red Deer and no one ever called me back. Or I called the admin line and did you actually make a complaint? Who made the complaint? Did you have someone else call on your behalf? I've gone to follow up on calls, calls for service that, okay, yeah, we called and the police never came. I go looking for that file because I wanna know why the police didn't go. If we were called and we didn't go, I wanna know. Did we miss it? Did it not get dispatched? Is it on the dispatch side of things or is it policeman error at our end going, yeah, I just didn't feel like going. It happens from time to time, not very often, because they know if I find out, <laughs> they're going to get it, right? Yes. And Everything's if everything. If there's a complaint made, the complaint comes in. It, it has a chronological order. It goes into the queue. It's dispatched by way of priority. Yeah, we might not be there in an hour from now, but you should definitely hear from one of us when we're clear to actually take the call and say, "Yeah, the guy's gone now. He was here an hour ago." What was he wearing? Which way did he go? Can we follow up a little bit? Sure. We're looking for a guy with a red coat and a black backpack and a green toque and he was walking west on 50th Avenue. Go take a drive and see if you saw him. Right. Heck, if the member was driving around town like he should be doing, 
he probably drove by him. Yeah, I think I just saw him at the 7-Eleven. Turn on his heel and away he goes and we follow up with the investigation. <laughs> yeah, and But I if they don't that. call and they don't log the complaint properly, right. then my stats don't show that that crime type's going up or going down. Right. It's anecdotal. Is there a problem? Sure. How big of a problem? Don't know. Don't have any numbers. Don't have metrics behind it. Yeah. Now, sometimes there's, there's, there's certain crime types in the town where you don't need crime types to know there's a problem, right? Yeah. Four homicides last year, right? Way four too many, right? That, that was an issue for our town. Four homicides was an issue for this town. I don't need stats to tell me that. Yeah. Well, and I guess I just am looking at a, uh, a way to try to get the word out there. Like, don't it, call me. Don't complain to me. No. Let's, it, let's get the entire thing. Thank you for your call, involved. sir. Did you call the RCMP? Yeah. yeah. No. Next question. Why? Yeah. And yeah. if you have 10 people that call and you say, I didn't call, and I didn't call because of X, Y, Z. You tell me they didn't call because of X, Y, Z, and I'll try and solve that. Yeah. And, and you know as well as us as a council, we put safety of this community forward, you know, yeah. for the entire time we've been there. And yeah, we just need more of the community to come on board with that, I believe. And like I say, I shouldn't have to ask, why didn't you phone the RCMP? So I, I just don't really know where we go from there. And, and, and I'm thinking, like you said, social media, and that type of thing, just to reach out to people, I think that's a great idea. Um, people should know this, but like I say, and like you mentioned, people are scared to phone. Some. Because they're, they're, they're scared they're gonna be targeted. Some some don't like being put on hold for too long. Yeah, yeah. But Some, yeah. some think, Matt, what are the cops gonna do anyway? Yeah. Right, well, we'll try and do something. If you're notified. If, if we're looking for them. <laughs> well, thank you for your answer, sir. Uh -huh. Through the chair to Keith. Um, yeah, no, I'm in favor of your five uh, objectives here. Um, if number two, your prolific offender management, I think that's where our backpacks, bicyclers will, that falls into that. Um, groups of guys that are sort of hanging around are homeless and, you know, selling them whatever um, so that must fit into there does that also fit into um gang graffiti tagging in certain areas then you zone into that area yes so that's all part and that'll of that. definitely go into the gang enforcement initiative there as okay. far as trying to identify these people who are doing the tagging the ones that are doing a specific tag yeah sometimes these things change sometimes you have to be talking to the individuals and interviewing them at length to try and understand the lifestyle. Um, we found this when dealing with the gangs down in Muscochise years ago, where, you know, what does a black bandana mean? What does a red bandana mean? What is a, you mm -hmm. know, and it's called flagging. If a guy's yeah. got one hanging off his belt loop or coming out of his pocket, he's flagging. He doesn't have to be doing the old gang sign on the corner. Yeah. Just standing there with a red bandana sitting out of his pocket is enough to, that's the message that they're sending. Yeah. Now, You've heard the old adage about walks and talks like a duck, right? Mm -hmm. You get three, four, five things. Okay, you're, you're, you're a duck. Yeah. Uh, but you could also just be a guy standing on the corner with a hanky hanging out of his pocket, right? <laughs> no, and I, I think because one and two tie in so close together. Yes, very much, sir. And it all I, does. It and, all does. And I think uh, Councillor Billsley, you know, when he was sort of questioning about the bike thing, you know, if that's priority. Well, that is a priority because that is sort of tied into one and two. Sure. The other piece here that this follows is it follows that data to action program that Mr. Tufik came down and presented on. Mm -hmm. All of these fit into data to action because a lot of this intelligence, even on the domestic side of things, we can do a look and do an intel dive and say, okay, our intelligence saying that these are our top six offenders in domestic yeah. violence. We need to be doing something with that. Now, Constable Wood at my office, who's my full-time DVET coordinator, he does that automatic. He's already, he already gets this mm -hmm. and he's, it's in drilled in him. So when he sees the same names coming across his desk on a regular basis, he's already talking to probation. He's already talking to the court saying, hey, listen, we've got a problem with this couple. Yeah. We've got to get this sorted out, right? So that's prolific offender management. Number two, 
just by doing and grinding down that intel and saying these three couples or these four couples in our community are our top four domestic violence that's prolific offender management mm -hmm. you can use the same principle in break and enters you can use the same principles in aggravated assaults and yeah. we've had a few we had a few uh, unlawful confinements last year end of last year and stuff like that which, which was kind of gang related stuff right initiations mm -hmm. and things like that that just goes to we get, get it by doing it under that's why prolific offender management is under both persons crimes and property crimes yeah okay thank you any more questions Thank you for your time. Thank you, Keith. And well, now I will adjourn our cow meeting or unless there's any more. Two, two, four, three. And we will come back at four o'clock for a council meeting.